Okay, shall we start? Yeah, certainly. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third weekly webinar for the month of uh, gastroenterology and hepatology. So uh, the topic for today is small bowel bacterial overgrowth. So uh, our chairperson for today is Dr. Mohamad Firdaus, who is the consultant and head of unit gastroenterology and hepatology in Hospital Sultan Amina, Johor Bahru. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Firdaus. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Kelvin. Okay, to all participants uh, here, I would like to uh, welcome uh, every one of you to our weekly uh, College of uh, Physician uh, series of lecture. And uh, today uh, we are going to have uh, another important topic in gastroenterology series uh, that is uh, actually rarely talked about. So the topic uh, is uh, small bowel, uh, small intestinal uh, bacterial overgrowth. Okay, what probably uh, majority of us uh, know uh, all about uh, SIBO or small intestinal bowel uh, overgrowth, uh, a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is that it occurs uh, when there is an abnormal increase uh, in uh, bacterial pop populations in the small intestine and the usual presentation of it, which is uh, diarrhea. Okay, maybe we are not very certain uh, what investigations to do uh, to confirm the, the, the diagnosis and whether the investigation, whether the tests uh, are available <laughs> anywhere in the country and what are the treatment options for this uh, problem. So uh, with us today, with us this afternoon is Dr. Chua Ki Huat, who is a consultant gastroenterologist and hepatologist from the University of Malaya Medical Center. So Dr. Chua will be uh, speaking about this topic of uh, small bowel uh, bacterial overgrowth, uh, 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 the diagnosis and the management and everything about bacterial overgrowth. Yeah? So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Chua to deliver his talk. Over to you, Dr. Chua. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fidaus, for your kind introduction. And thank you to... Uh, to the College of Physicians Malaysia, Dr. Kelvin, Dr. Shamuga for the invitation for me to deliver this talk. I hope to share with you uh, some knowledge about uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. I'm Dr. Chaki Huat from University of Malaya. Right, without further ado, uh, let me uh, start my presentation. I'll start with the case presentation first. Madam M, a 62-year-old lady, with underlying diabetes and hypertension under the GP follow-up, presented with abdominal discomfort associated with diarrhea for six months. She had three to five times of loose stool per day. However, there's no other reflex symptom. For example, loss of appetite, loss of weight, no PR bleed, no anemia, and she wasn't sure about the family history of the colon cancer. HbA1c is nine, uh, of hers was nine, creatinine 120, her medication is uh, metformin, 1 gram BD, and had a recent increase of uh, the dose uh, to 1 gram from 500 BD six months ago. Sorry, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Cho, can I interrupt? Your slide doesn't seem to move. All right. Oh, okay. All right, sure. Let me see. Um, yeah, I should try this. Is it moving? Yes, it is now. Oh, now all right, I'm sorry for the technical glitch. All right, so uh, back to the slides. Uh, so patient has HbA1c of 9%, creatinine 120, and her medication was recently increased, uh, metformin, uh, to 1 gram BD. Otherwise, she was on uh, glycoside, simostatin, and perindopril, quite a standard medication that we are using day to day. And how are you going to manage this patient? And I'm sure this, uh, you see this kind of uh, situation quite often, not only uh, among us, uh, the gastroenterologists, I'm sure in your MOPD, uh, in your um, you know, uh, GP, KK settings, also you might see a lot of uh, such situation. So uh, in other words, how do we uh, to approach a patient with chronic diarrhea? So based on these guidelines uh, of uh, 
of, for the investigation of chronic diarrhea in adults uh, based on BSG, British Society of uh, Gastroenterology, that was published uh, not too long ago. So again, uh, starting with blood tests, simple blood tests like football count, uh, iron, iron studies, you know, inflammatory markers, thyroid function, celiac serology, especially uh, in Caucasian population, uh, two tests sometimes. And of course, uh, we need to rule out colon cancer, especially uh, in this situation, whereby you need to explore the red flag symptoms. Uh, explore when is the onset. For this patient, she's already 62 and the onset of diarrhea is at 62. So it's considered a red flag symptom. Also, you want to ask for hematochesia, anemia, loss of appetite, loss of weight, family history. So uh, typically uh, during MRCP exam or any uh, medical school exam or any exam, you need to explore all this. Another common scenario uh, or situation or diagnosis, differential diagnosis could be inflammatory bowel disease. Then inflammatory uh, irritable bowel syndrome uh, is also another common situation whereby uh, the diagnosis is by the uh, latest room for diagnostic criteria. Hyperthyroidism are also common and they are the most common non-GI cause. Uh, celiac disease, although it's common in the West or in other parts of the Asia, for example, India, but it's, it was found to be less common in Malaysia. Medications are also important, uh, especially in this situation, uh, like diabetic patient. Uh, just briefly about colon uh, cancer. Uh, colon cancer is very common in Malaysia. It's among the most common in the world. As you can see, the uh, incident rates are about 15 per 100,000. Then if you look into our CBG Malaysia, our national strategic plan for colorectal cancer, you can see for male, they are the most common cancer uh, in Malaysia. For female, they are second most common after breast cancer. So uh, with, with the high prevalence of uh, colon cancer in uh, the world, the American, society, uh, American Cancer Society even advocate uh, for colon cancer screening uh, starting from the age of 45 to 75 for average risk patient. For example, those patients without symptom, they don't have any red flag symptom, they don't have any significant family history. They should start screening at the age of 45. So the testing options are stool-based tests, for example, you know, stool for occult blood, stool, uh, stool for uh, immunohistochemistry tests, then colonoscopy, uh, otherwise CT colonography may be less preferred. Uh, but these are the tests that are, are important that we can do uh, to screen for colon cancer. If you to choose the strategy of a stool test, then you have to do it every year. Whereas if you do, uh, you choose a strategy for colonoscopy surveillance, if it's normal, you can do every 10 years. Uh, we have also recently published uh, uh, in regards to our uh, epidemiology uh, spectrum of uh, GI and liver disease in Malaysia, in, especially in our uh, settings, in our secondary care settings, in our um, specialist clinic, whereby we found that actually functional GI cause uh, disorder is among the most common uh, dis disease, GI disease, luminal GI disease. Among them, IBS are common. Then follow uh, also among the most common organic cause uh, of luminal GI disease are inflammatory bowel disease. As I mean, actually, in fact, our centers are the referral center for inflammatory bowel, uh, bowel disease. That's why uh, we, we find quite a high number in our you know, epidemiology uh, trends of uh, the GI and liver disease in our center. Back to the case. Uh, so, of course, I'm sure most of you will also do the same thing. Switch the uh, OHA, the oral hypoglycemic agent, from metformin to metformin XR. So, which I, I did that the uh, as well. Then I arranged a colonoscopy for her, especially this patient has red flag symptom because her onset of diarrhea is after you know after forty five years old is at, at sixty two. So I did the colonoscopy and found actually a quite a big uh, polyps. Uh, huh? this polyps is about four cm which I remove it by uh, uh, EMR, huh? endoscopic mucosal resection. So follow up after one month, patient was very happy as her symptoms improved significantly, the diarrhea resolved. But I, I want to say that most of the time, these kind of polyps, they don't develop symptoms. 
a lot of time it's uh, uh, I mean they are asymptomatic until they develop you know colon cancer whereby they have PR bleed or diarrhea. So I suppose for this patient, the diarrhea is more of because of the oral hypoglycemic agent like metformin, which are commonly causing all these GI symptoms. So histopathology of the polyps are found to have adenoma with high-grade dysplasia. So not yet developed uh, cancer, but I'm sure uh, if we leave it for uh, not too long, they will develop cancer if we don't remove it. Fortunately for this patient, uh, you know, a complete resection was done. And so she was discharged uh, back to the GP and we are planned for colonoscopy surveillance in one year. However, she came back two years later her G, because she was very happy uh, within these two years, so not much of GI symptoms until recently, whereby she had uh, GI symptoms, her GI symptoms recurred. But mainly this time is more of uh, abdominal bloatedness and some diarrhea. Her HbA1c, in fact, is not improving, worsened at 10.5 and did a recent uh, colonoscopy for her, even uh, go into the terminal ileum, explore, evaluate the terminal ileum was normal, completely normal. So, of course, uh, besides our common uh, situation whereby we wanted to rule out back the uh, colon cancer, IBD, you know, even IBS, uh, thyroid, uh, etc., other important things we shouldn't forget is infection, uh, um, including, uh, so in exam, we have to ask for high-risk behavior or, or we have to take the HIV test as well and look for parasitic infection, uh, explore the travel history as well. Uh, it could be because of gertiasis, or even I had a patient uh, not too long ago, a strong geloidosis, uh, parasitic infection that caused you know, malabsorption and, and diarrhea. Then uh, quite commonly, I'm sure Dr. Fidas will agree also, GI tuberculosis can be quite common, especially in this region. Bowel acid diarrhea can happen as well, especially those with risk factor, for example, right hemicolectomy with the terminal ileum resection, whereby uh, the bowel uh, cannot be reabsorbed then, uh, or those with cholecystectomy, they are higher risk of bowel acid diarrhea. Microscopic colitis always have to rule out and we can do biopsy during the colonoscopy, but it's less common in Malaysia. Lactose intolerance can be quite common in the Asia Pacific region, but usually we can get from history. But of course, we can also confirm uh, with a lactose hydrogen breath test, which we have the test in our center. Malabsorption, uh, various malabsorption can happen, especially those with chronic pancreatitis. Huh? So they can also have statoria and diarrhea. And also importantly, we want to know whether this is truly diarrhea or fecal incontinence. Uh, less common cause like carcinoid syndrome. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can also think of small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So for this patient, I've explored other causes which was found to be negative. Then I proceeded uh, to order a glucose hydrogen breath test. In fact, uh, this glucogen, uh, glucose hydrogen breath test was positive. You know, to be, in order to be positive, uh, you have to look into the hydrogen level. Okay, uh, increment by more than 20 from baseline. The baseline is 33. By more than 20 means if it's more than 53 in any point, uh, usually we will do the test and we do the, ask the patient to repeatedly do every 15 minutes for, uh, for, for two hours. So by two hours or by 90 minutes, actually, in fact, if there's increment by more than 20 uh, hydrogen uh, parts per particle, PPM, then it will be considered as positive. Another level that we also evaluate is the CH4, which is the methane. Any level of more than 10 ppm will be considered as positive. So this patient has actually a positive uh, glucose hydrogen breath test, which is considered as a uh, presence of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Okay, let's focus a uh, zoom into the uh, our main topic of today, the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. Let's go to the background first. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, as already uh, explained by Dr. Fidas, and it's characterized by the presence of excessive amount of bacteria within the small intestine, which may result in a constellation of GI symptoms. The isolated gram-positive flora may include strep, staph, uh, enterococcus, mitrococcus, and etc. And also some uh, 
uh, gram-negative flora, the predominantly may have E. coli, Klebsiella, Proteus, and etc. So uh, overgrowth of these bacteria may cause a uh, uh, constellation of GI symptoms. In terms of epidemiology, SIBO has been reported uh, in up to 0 to 22%, you know, depending primarily on the type of diagnostic test used. Of course, those with risk factors, for example, the predisposing uh, condition, they are, they are, their prevalence rate, their incidence rate is higher. And frequency of SIBO is, of course, higher in elderly, ranging from 14.5 to 56. Uh, let's talk about a normal variant of our own uh, GI tract features and bacteria composition and content. As you can see that, okay, so usually our uh, bacteria counts and bacteria content is on the lowish side inside the stomach as well as duodenum and jejunum. They are generally has less than 10 to power of three, uh, you know, colony, uh, uh, per meal uh, content, but as, as uh, we progress from proximally to the distal small intestine to the colon, the amount of uh, the bacterial count will definitely increase exponentially, you know, from up to uh, 10 to power of 11, okay? Um, the ox of course, the aerobes uh, bacterial uh, form will be, you know, uh, from the proximal colon will, will be lesser uh, in the distal uh, small intestine compared to the anaerobes, whereby uh, when, when you travel distally to the small intestine, the anaerobes will predominate rather than the aerobes. Yes, they are, they are, our body has a, you know a amazing mechanism that protects against the development of uh, small intestinal bacteria uh, overgrowth in healthy people. And uh, that may be susceptible if there's presence uh, disruption in one of the mechanism, uh, for example, in certain diseases, okay? Our gastric acid in our uh, stomach, you know, as well as the bilio uh, pancreatic secre secretions, uh, all those proteolytic uh, enzymes, uh, you know, will reduce uh, the bacterial propagation and they will make the environment uh, less suitable for the bacteria to survive inside our stomach and uh, small intestine. Our intestinal motor activity causing the motility movement, you know, the, uh, the intestinal migrating complex, you know, will prevent stagnant, uh, stagnant of our, you know, intestinal content in our small intestine. Therefore, uh, you know, to prevent the growth of our, you know, to prevent the growth of uh, bacteria. Of course, intestinal mucosal integrity, whereby our own intestinal mucosal integrity will have uh, the intrinsic antibacterial mechanism. They may have this uh, immunoglobulin and uh, antidefensin that will prevent uh, the bacterial overgrowth. At the same time, the commensal flora, the good commensal flora, you know, they will compete with the pathogenic uh, flora to prevent the overgrowth of pathogenic flora. Last but not least, the ileocecal waft, the intact ileocecal waft will prevent, you know, retrograde uh, migration uh, from, uh, the, from the, bacterial, uh, the bacterial content of the colon inside into, small intest uh, into the small intestine. Therefore, this combination of mechanism will prevent the development of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Of course, uh, there are conditions that are associated with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, whereby any of the mechanism was uh, impaired that will cause you know, uh, more condition to be associated with SIBO. For example, in the situation where mechanical cause like small, small bowel tumor, wobulus, intersusception, or post-surgical cause like adhesion. So this situation, may cause stagnant of the intestinal content. Of course, when you're stagnant of your uh, certain uh, content, there will be, uh, that, there's a good, uh, good environment for bacterial overgrowth. Systemic disease as well, for example, diabetes and scleroderma, whereby they have a, a motility, dismotility, you know, their impact in the motility, whereby again, stagnant, uh, stagnant of the you know, intestinal content and, and promote the bacterial overgrowth. 
diabetes also can impact the immunity of the body, you know, uh, and also causing uh, a reduction in our good condenser of the uh, microflora. That will also encourage the bacterial overgrowth. Certain motility conditions like IBS, uh, pseudo obstruction, they, they tend to you know, promote uh, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Opioids as well, huh? as well as potent anti secretory agents like uh, you know, PPI, whereby uh, they, will reduce the acid uh, they will reduce the acid secretion, which is, you know, has some antibacterial properties. More absorptive condition, for example, pancreatic insufficiency, chronic pancreatitis, they reduce the production of pancreatic enzyme, cirrhosis, you know, immune related like HIV, combined, combined variable immunity deficiency, IgA deficiency, others like uh, aging and small bowel diverticulosis that promotes, you know, a stagnant of the intestinal content. In terms of pathophysiology, as you can imagine, uh, the bacteria, uh, carbohydrate fermentation of, of, of certain of carbohydrate, they will cause a lot of gas, you know, hydrogen, you know, methane, and whatever. They will cause a lot of flatulence. They will cause abdominal pain. They will cause abdominal distension as well as diarrhea. Bacteria uh, overgrowth also can cause bacterial bowel acid deconjugation that can promote statorrhea, diarrhea, and of course. Uh, causing our uh, light lipid soluble vitamin poorly absorbed, and we might have a vitamin deficiency. All right. Other situations like you know bacterial macronutrient and micronutrient use, they compete with the host for our, all our you know our nutrient uh, content, then can cause malnutrition. Of course, intestinal inflammation uh, and increased uh, permeability, systemic inflammation. All those can cause, you know, uh, villous blunting, carbohydrate malformation, uh, malabsorption, and diarrhea. In a uh, pediatric population, those can even cause stunted growth. All right, um, next, I would like to focus on the clinical features as well as diagnostic tests. Clinical features, the most common uh, symptoms are abdominal pain and bloating uh, together with gas, uh, distension, flatulence, and diarrhea. These are based on various uh, guidelines. Uh, uh, even the American uh, College of uh, Gastroenterology, they, they actually uh, mentioned that bloating is among the most common symptoms. But I guess all those symptoms are very nonspecific. There's no pattern mnemonic uh, uh, sign or symptom that can characterize this SIBO. So any of the symptoms a uh, patient can present as SIBO. Uh, a lot of time, uh, they don't have malnutrition, but of course, in severe cases, they may have malnourished as well as statoria, peripheral edema, anemia, weight loss, and deficiency of these fat and water-soluble vitamins, especially vitamin D and B12, other micronutrients, and also failure to thrive in pediatric population. All right. In terms of the diagnosis and challenges, all right, uh, diagnosis per se, I mean, there's actually no perfect test for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Of course, the small intestinal aspirate and culture is considered the gold standard. We have this deep duodenal or jejunal aspirate, which we can be, we, I mean, we, we actually, it's not difficult for gastroenterologists to do it. Uh, but there are certain limitations. Huh? To diagnose SIBO, there'll be growth of the bacteria of more than 10 to the power of 5 colony forming units CFU per meal, or more than 10 to the power of 3 CFU, particularly if coliforms are present on a quantitative culture of upper gut aspirate. Actually, in fact, we don't culture, I mean, the, the thing is, uh, at the moment, the guideline is not to culture the type of bacteria, but it's more of the growth of the colony form unit. You want to uh, diagnose it based on this criteria rather than just type of the bacteria. But there are so many limitations in this uh, uh, strategy whereby standardized techniques for aseptic collection of small bowel aspirate samples are not easy. 
sample handling and subsequent culture are lacking. So these are the you know, challenges that may be faced by not only us, the, uh, the, the microbiologists as well. And it's expensive and invasive. Sometimes only 30% of the gut bacteria can be cultured because we difficult to go in beyond you know, uh, the proximal jejunum, you know, or, or sometimes difficult to go in beyond the duodenum, especially if we use the normal scope. Lah. So with that, there are another strategies that are quite, um, I mean, hi highly recommended by uh, certain guidelines. For example, breath test. Quantitative measurement of the breath, hydrogen, and methane. It's uh, relatively inexpensive, non-invasive at all, and easy to be done. It's recommended as an alternative test comparable to culture by uh, American uh, College of Gastroenterology Guideline and North American Consensus. This is the machine. Actually, uh, we have it uh, in our center as well in UM. Uh, uh, USM also have this machine as well. I'm not sure about other centers. So the principle of breath test, what can we do actually? Uh, what, what, what's the principle? Actually, uh, human cells are incapable of producing hydrogen and methane gas. So any uh, detection of the hydrogen or methane gas are considered as, you know, must be from something else. For example, uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. To diagnose, uh, to test for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, usually the recommended uh, substrate we use is uh, glucose, 75 gram of glucose or 10 gram of lactulose. So the bacterial fermentation of the amount absorbed sugar produce hydrogen or methane gas. Then these gas are absorbed into the bloodstream and carried to the lung. Then concentration of exhaled breath, hydrogen, and methane are then measured to the test. They blew into the, to the test. So a rise of hydrogen by more than 20 ppm by 90 minutes during the glucose or lactulose uh, breath test for SIBO was considered as positive. Or any methane level of more than 10 was considered as methane positive. Either one criteria uh, you know, will be suggestive of uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. These are the example from the uh, American guidelines where you can see, you know, increment, uh, increment of the hydrogen level uh, in this line. As you can see, more than 20 will be considered as uh, positive. Increment by 20 uh, over the 90 minutes. Uh, in contrast, uh, in this dotted line, as you can see, there's any increment of more than 10 uh, by any time over the 90 minutes is considered as positive for methane. In situation whereby, you know, the increment of the uh, hydrogen and methane is less than 10 or 20 is considered as negative. So these are the three examples of uh, uh, breath tests. So how do you choose? Whether you want to choose a glucose hydrogen breath test or lactulose hydrogen breath test. As I mentioned earlier, there's no perfect test for SIBO. Again, the sensitivity uh, for glucose hydrogen breath test is only 0 0.54 and specificity is 0 0.83. So in other words, if it's positive, likely this is SIBO, but if it's negative, it may not be 100% ruled out. So uh, on the other hand, lactulose breath test, their sensitivity is 0 0.42 and specificity is 0 0.71. So the limitation of uh, GHBT, the glucose breath test versus lactose breath test are, Glucose is readily absorbed proximally, meaning that when we swallow the glucose, you know, you know, over the proximal uh, small intestine, for example, our uh, duodenum, jejunum, it will probably completely absorb already. So there's a bacterial overgrowth over the distal part, for example, in the in ileum or so, may be difficult to detect uh, the, the, the SIBO. So there is a low sensitivity in detecting the distal SIBO. In terms of lactulose, lactulose are completely poorly digested by the small intestine. Uh, so actually, in fact, you know, they, are, they, 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 they might even cause a false positive situation because we assume that our oral to cecum transit time is about 90 minutes. But there are many patients, there are certain patients, not many, there are certain patients that has an oral to cecum transit time that is shorter than 90 minutes, meaning that you take the lactulose you know, maybe by 90 minutes, it will reach a colon. 
and uh, patient that blow the test, it may show positive because colonic microorganism, colonic bacteria will metabolize the lactulose and form the hydrogen anyway. So this may cause the false positive of lactulose. So there are quite a number of limitations here and there for each and every test. So in terms of recommend, recommendation from ACG guideline on who to test on, so they recommend that use of a GHBT, glucose hydrogen breakfast, or lactulose hydrogen breakfast for the diagnosis of SIBO in patients with IBS. But uh, the, it's a conditional recommendation, very low level of evidence. Number two, they also advise use of GHBT or LHBT for the diagnosis of SIBO in symptomatic uh, patients with suspected motility disorder. Uh, I mean, for example, all those with scleroderma or even diabetes patients with you know, autonomic neuropathy also uh, may be uh, considered. Then use of uh, GHBT and LHBT for diagnosis of SIBO in symptomatic patients with uh, Previous luminal abdominal surgery, uh, they, they ha may have all this uh, stagnant of the flu, uh, stagnant uh, because of the adhesion or strictures, uh, they, they have stagnant of the intestinal content. They are prone to get a uh, SIBO anyway. So if they are symptomatic, uh, you know, GHBT or LHBT can be considered. Uh, let's go through some systemic review as well as meta-analysis. In this uh, meta-analysis of uh, 25 studies with 3,192 patients with IBS and 3,320 controls, where you can see SIBO prevalence in patients with IBS was significantly increased compared with control with an odd ratio of 3.7. You know? So uh, you know, a patient with IBS has higher prevalence of uh, frequency of SIBO compared to controls. And who, who in terms of a uh, patient with IBS, Patient with IBS diarrhea compared with patient with IBS constipation was more commonly associated with SIBO uh, the, the, with the odd ratio of 1.86, meaning that uh, SIBO, SIBO in patient with IBS diarrhea are more common compared with uh, IBS uh, patients with IBS constipation. Similarly, in our center, and actually, in fact, we have done a collaboration with USM uh, we have found also small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in various FGID cases. Uh, we, we did a case control studies. We found that actually IBSD is the one that are significantly associated with SIBO with a prevalence of 24% uh, uh, compared to 10% in control. And it was statistically significant compared to other uh, functional gastrointestinal disorder. We have also uh, submitted another uh, paper for publication, look into the impact of small intestinal bacteria overgrowth in patients with IBS uh, to look at the symptoms and quality of life. We found that uh, all IBS patients, right, uh, about 26% has SIBO. Among the SIBO population, 36% has severe IBS are uh, measured by uh, the validated uh, score, like IBS SS score, IBS symptom severity score. 36% uh, versus 16% among the non uh, SIBO IBS patient. We have run through a multivariate analysis. We found that SIBO was the only independent factors associated with severe IBS. And the presence of SIBO was associated with poorer health related quality of life. So perhaps there are more reasons for us to do uh, uh, the test, uh, breath test uh, for IBS patients, especially in those with IBS with diarrhea. Uh, the fourth recommendation uh, from the ACG guideline to test for methane using the GHBT or LHBT to diagnose the overgrowth of methane producing organism in symptomatic patients with constipation. However, the level of confidence, uh, level of evidence is still very low. So in a systemic review and meta-analysis that were published back in uh, 2011, nine studies, 1,200, uh, 1,277 subjects were examined by breath tests. A significant association was found between methane on breath tests and constipation with an odd ratio of 
zero point uh, with an odd ratio of three point five one. So certain patient with constipation, uh, mainly is the um, slow transit constipation type of patient will have may be associated with methane positive uh, small intestinal bacteria overproof. Okay, now I would like to talk about the, the final portion, the management strategies. So management strategies uh, need to focus on treatment of predisposing condition to prevent the recurrence uh, and also to uh, start the appropriate antibiotics and correct the nutritional deficiency. This is the Asian uh, guidelines or consensus on SIBO that was recently published. So if you have a clinical suspicion of SIBO, should go for a SIBO test like GHBT or you know, gut aspirate culture. Then investigate for underlying cause. If SIBO present, treat, treat with a rifaximin. That's a recommendation. If present of nutritional deficiency, manage the nutritional deficiency. If there's no response, reassess again. And if positive again, we treat with rifaximin. If there's presence of symptomatic response, you may just follow up. If presence of recurrent symptoms, may reassess and retreat with rifaximin. To prevent recurrence, of course, you want to treat the underlying cause, predisposing condition, may consider cyclical or rotating antibiotics, probiotics or prokinetics. So rifaximin, you know, rifaximin uh, is a structural analog of rifax, uh, rifampin that inhibit bacterial RNA synthesis by binding to the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's a non-absorbable antimicrobial gut uh, effective, uh, drugs effective against both aerobic and anaerobic gram-positive as well as gram-negative bacteria. A lot of times I, I tell the patient that it's a cut-specific antibiotic. So in a meta-analysis of 32 studies, uh, including uh, one uh, more than 1,000 patients with SIBO, frequency of eradication of SIBO with rifaximin was as high as 72.9%, which is good. The ACG clinical guideline, the American guideline, suggests that uh, the antibiotic of choice is non-absorbable antibiotic, rifaximin, they have an efficacy of 61 to 78%. For many centers that uh, do not have rifaximin, some other antibiotic may be considered. For example, amoxy, cipro, doxy, metronidazole, neomycin, which may even be uh, more effective uh, for uh, methane positive. Neomycin combination with rifaximin might be more effective for uh, methane positive uh, SIBO. No foxacin, tetracycline, and bactrim. But uh, suggested antibiotic is rifaximin if possible. Uh, there's a recent publication in the UEG, the European Journal. Uh, they suggest that rotating antibiotic versus single cause antibiotic, uh, you know, rotating antibiotic have a higher chance of, uh, uh, you know, eradication of the SIBO. Rotating, how they rotate the antibiotic, they use a metronidazole, uh, about you know, 500 TDS for 10 consecutive days. Uh, one after the other with no floxacin 800 mg per day or ofloxacin 400 mg per day for 10 consecutive days for three months. Means that first month, they use metronidazole, second month, they use the other one. Uh, then third month, use another one again. Compared to those, you know, antibiotic like uh, azole only, uh, like metronidazole or quinolones like Cipro, etc. So they found that rotating antibiotic, in fact, has a less failure rate compared to uh, the single antibiotic. So back to the case, Madam M. So the key component of management of SIBO, including the following. So we should do a, a treat the predisposing condition. I'm sure the HbA1c, you know, all of you will be jumping here and there. The HbA1c of 10, you know. So need uh, so I referred to endocrinologists for optimization of HbA1c. Okay, then start the appropriate antibiotic, uh, rifaximin. Then, uh, I mean, in our center, we don't have the 550 mg uh, dose. So we have the 200 mg per tablet dose. So I started 400 mg TDS for two weeks. Then correction of nutritional deficiency if present. Fortunately, not in this patient. So after one month, I repeated the GHPT and it was normal. And her symptoms improved significantly. She was also started on the BITS regime 
uh, subcute insulatat and empaglifuzin by the endocrinologist. And the uh, home glucose monitoring was under control subsequently. So just a, a, a little bit more on recurrence of SIBO. Recurrence of SIBO can be common. In an Italian study, you know, can be 12.6%, uh, 27.5%, and 43.7% for those successfully treated recurred after three months, six months, and nine months follow-up, respectively. Target three study is, a, is, a, you know, is one of the important studies for rifaximin show that the safety and efficacy of retreatment with rifaximin, you know, for those that has initial response but recur, then retreat again, they found that it's effective and safe. Other strategies that may be helpful, it's the uh, uh, low FODMAP diet in the management of SIBO, but need further evaluation. No, uh, you know, strong evidence at the moment. But personally, uh, I've I've found found some of my patients have a lot of bloatedness and diarrhea. You know, um, sometimes because rifaximin can be expensive and difficult to get. Um, uh, while waiting for the rifaximin, of course, eventually I will want to treat them with rifaximin. Uh, sometimes, uh, in the meantime, started on low FODMAP diet. I mean, um, under the dietitian guidelines. It was helpful uh, in certain extent. Probiotics may be, may be some benefit, but more evidence is required according to our Asian consensus. I mean, many people would like to ask, what if the test for SIBO is not easily available? Okay, for example, in Malaysia settings, there are many centers that don't have the test like a hydrogen breath test or aspirate. So what can we do? Based on these BSG guidelines on the chronic diarrhea, remember that I showed you uh, earlier on, so they suggested that in the absence of optimal tests to confirm the presence of SIBO, and in those with a high test probability of SIBO, for example, the anatomical anomalies like dilatation, diverticulosis in the small bowel, prior abdominal surgery or pseudo obstruction, they recommend an empirical trial of uh, antibiotics. Although the recommendation is strong, but the level of evidence is weak. Lah. So in this study that was published uh, more than 10 years ago in NEJM, uh, rifaximin therapy for patients with IBS without constipation. Uh, I mean, these studies have shown that it's a double-blinded study. Uh, there's 600, uh, more than 600 patients was included in the target one. Uh, and also another 600 were, uh, were, were assigned to the target two. Uh, each three each were assigned to rifaximin versus placebo. Significantly more patients in the rifaximin group than the placebo group had adequate relief of global IBS symptoms during the first four weeks after the treatment. 40% versus 31 in target one, and 40 versus 32 in target two, and 40 versus 31 uh, if the two studies are combined. Although they are statistically significant, but you, uh, and it's very, you know, less than 0 0.01. But if you look into the numerical number, actually there's in fact only 10% difference in terms of improvement compared to placebo. However, based on these studies, you know, FDA has approved uh, the use for, you know, for use for IBS with diarrhea uh, using rifaximin. It's uh, approved by FDA. And you can use a 550 mg TDS for 14 days and retreat up to two times if symptoms recur. This is based on MIMS Malaysia. Uh, however, if you look, you zoom into this, uh, another studies, actually it's an extent of the target one, target two studies. You know, uh, it was published in American Journal of Gastroenterology. Patients with IBS with SIBO show a much better response to antibiotics as compared to those without SIBO. You know, as you can see, there's a you know composite endpoint is the abdominal pain and stool consistency. If they treat rifaximin for those has positive baseline uh, like, uh, lactulose breath test compared to those negative uh, baseline lactulose breath test, all of them are IBS patients. Uh. You can see 59.7 versus 25.8 percent. It's about uh, 20, 25 or 35 percent. Is, is much higher compared to, you know, any JM paper whereby only 10% difference. Uh, in other words, if you, you have the breath test, you can test on those IBS with diarrhea patient and treat accordingly, you know, treat 
uh, with, with Faxinin, perhaps, you know. So in summary, uh, what should we do? Uh, identify GI symptoms suggestive of SIBO. Then identify the risk factor and consider, uh, condition associated with SIBO. Um, perhaps at this moment, in the, in the time whereby we don't have a perfect test, maybe non-invasive tests like glucose or lactulose hydrogen breath test may be recommended. Management-wise, treat the predisposing condition. Start suitable antibiotic and correct any malnutrition. With that, I would like to thank you and I'm happy to accept uh, any question. All right, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Chua, for a very interesting and informative uh, presentation. All right, uh, you can uh, post your question in the chat box here. Yeah, so there is one question uh, Which center can run hydrogen uh, breath tests other than UM and USM? I think there is none in the KKM uh, facility, and none in KKM hospitals. I don't know about uh, UKM. But uh, if we were to do in private hospital, uh, do you know where, where is it? Where is it? Um, I mean, uh, what's the cost? And where can we ask the question to go to, Dr. Chua? All right. Uh, I mean, in private center will be our UMSC law, I suppose. UMSC, um, the cost, uh, I should double confirm, I think it's more than 500 ringgit, perhaps it's 600 or 700, if not mistaken. I think it's around, around there, like, around that region. It's quite expensive also. Okay. Mm, 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 mm. Correct. There is a, a recommendation uh, I mean, in the guidelines that we, we, we can use... Uh, we can uh, treat empirically with antibiotic. We don't have that facility to do, to do the hydrogen uh, breath test. Uh, yeah. What about the, the small bowel aspirate and culture? Do you, is there any uh, in the guidelines? I mean, any oh, recommendations oh. to do that in the guidelines as well? Oh, actually, it's it's actually it's considered as the uh, uh, gold, standard. gold standard at the moment. However, you know, there are so many technical difficulties, you know, because, you know, as you know, we, when we do a uh, scope, uh, OGDS, or even uh, enteroscope, you know, uh, when we put in the scope through the mouth, there's so much of oral flora, okay. you know, that we may pick up along the way. And the catheters we use, we are not like, you know, sterile catheters and all. We don't have a proper, you know, catheters. So in... Uh, in a, a gold standard uh, situation uh, in overseas or somewhere, lah, huh? if we really want to do it, we have to do it you know, in a sterile manner. I mean, scope is scope, but the catheters have to be sterile and um, try to avoid uh, aspiration before we reach the deep uh, intubation of the duodenum or proximal uh, uh, jejunum and aspirate it. You know, and that's a special catheters actually. Uh, that we have to order. Then after aspirate, uh, the medium to culture and all uh, need, need to lie with the microbiologist. It's not easy. It's not easy. And of course, scope can be slightly more invasive than breath test. And a lot of things we have to consider and a lot of technical issue la, to do the aspirate and the cost la, is the issue. La. All right, okay. So apart from uh, antibiotics uh, that is used to, to, to treat uh, SIBO and uh, probably probiotic as well that might have some uh, benefit, uh, is there any benefit also uh, if you suggest prebiotic to the patient? Right. That's why it's very difficult. At the moment, prebiotic, probiotic, and not even probiotic is recommended yet. So uh, in the guidelines, they said that, you know, uh, the evidence is not strong. It's at the moment, not yet as a recommendation yet. Oh, all right. Okay. okay. So uh, if we can see one more question there. <laughs> if you can see uh, elderly is one of the uh, group which is prone to develop uh, SIBO as compared to uh, uh, other uh, groups uh, uh, of the uh, populations. So what... Uh, 
makes this group more prone to have SIBO as compared to gender population. Why, why is it so, is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, because uh, in elderly, uh, uh, the motility is slowed down due to various reasons, uh, due to this uh, uh, myopathy as well as neuropathy of the small intestine, thereby, uh, whereby they have more uh, slow transit uh, of their intestine including they are more often associated with constipation. So with this uh, slow transit uh, in terms of motility, they have a lot of stagnation of the in intestinal content. For, uh, then for sure, uh, once you have this uh, stagnation, for example, uh, all these adhesion strictures, uh, small bowel surgery, uh, they, they are more prone to uh, bacterial overgrowth. Okay. So, yeah. It's um, uh, mainly because of the, uh, the mortality problem as well. Yeah? Hmm. Okay, there are two more questions in the uh, chat box here. Uh, question number one, Rifaximim is expensive and even in the UK, it is still not licensed for the use in uh, SIBO. Would you recommend cycling antibiotics to begin with? And what are your personal preferences in terms of antibiotic choices? Right, okay, uh, it's a very good question actually. In fact, rifaximin uh, is not even uh, approved uh, in Malaysia, not easily available in Malaysia, but we have it in UMSC and in certain private hospital, I think uh, it's available. So rifaximin, although it's not yet licensed, but uh, majority of the studies and majority of the guidelines in fact, recommended uh, rifaximin. But uh, if rifaximin is not available, so you may want to consider, you know, uh, the single use, uh, I mean, single antibiotic for two weeks. Either you can choose, because in Malaysia, we have a lot of Cipro, we have uh, Flagyl, you know, we, we can consider that. Uh, the French guidelines that was published in UEG, uh, the European Journal, they suggest a cyclical uh, antibiotic, uh, cycling the antibiotics, which may be another option to consider. They show that only 30% of failure rate, but the numbers are very small, only about 30 uh, patients. So the level of evidence is not strong. So I would think that uh, it's not wrong to do the cycling uh, antibiotics, but if you, you, you could consider that as even as a second line, if you have problems, if patient recurred, you can try that. Uh, you, you can try that as a second line. If you find that your first line of a single antibiotic doesn't work well. Lah. But of course, in this situation, I will also recommend that uh, if it's, it doesn't work with antibiotic, you should try to do a breath test at least or look for other causes. May not necessarily be SIBO, could be other causes. My personal choice is still uh, rifaximin. I'm using rifaximin for uh, SIBO actually. All right, is there any more questions? Oh, there's the one question on current evidence recommendation regarding fecal transplant in SIBO. Yeah. Actually, fecal transplantation uh, there's only one, actually, there's only one uh, a recommendation for that is for Clostridium difficile, uh, you know, pseudomembranous colitis. There's only one that, that, that whoever feel the antibiotics, feel the uh, vancomycin treatment, oral vancomycin. So that's the only one that has a clear cut evidence and strong evidence. The others are completely not strong. You know, many people want to do it for want to do it for IBS, IBD, SIBO, or whatever, all without uh, strong evidence. Actually, in fact. Okay, I think uh, one more last question that you from me. <laughs> uh, you you mentioned before that uh, gastric acid uh, uh, is one of the uh, protective things uh, against uh, SIBO. And uh, we can see uh, now, if you do rounds in medical ward, uh, almost, uh, I would say, uh, if not every patient, so majority of the patient will be put on PPI uh, for prophylaxis, for example, for whatever symptoms, anemia, for example. So what, what, 
what's your advice uh, on this, uh, Dr. Chua? Right. Oh, okay. I mean, similarly, we have this situation uh, in, in my centers as well, and as well as my previous centers uh, everywhere else. Lah. Okay. So again, there are many guidelines that came out with uh, PPI usage. Of course, there are, you know, there are many studies that show may have association with, you know, this side effect, that complication, but uh, majority of it still no clear-cut evidence. But majority of guidelines would have already recommended only uh, start PPI for those indicated patients. For example, those patients uh, had GI bleed with uh, antiplatelet. Because antiplatelet is so important. Though then, uh, you know, you, you have to be on antiplatelet. But once the patient on antiplatelet it has GI bleed, then you have to add on the prophylaxis to, to, to continue it. Then uh, other situation whereby if there's presence of functional dyspepsia also, the PPI should be short-term rather than long-term. And, and many, many other things like, uh, that if PPI is not indicated, uh, we should stop it or we should use it as a short duration, not for long-term, if not indicated. All right, okay. Dr. Fidos, do you have any uh, thing to you know, add on and advise? Oh, uh, basically, it's nothing with regards to PPI. Uh, yeah, as, as, as you said, uh, uh, we can see majority of uh, patients being put, uh, probably some, uh, some of them are probably really uh, unnecessarily. Uh, yeah, so I think we should uh, avoid that if really not, uh, not uh, necessary to be on that medication. Okay. Exactly. All right, if there is uh, no more uh, uh, questions to... Uh, Dr. Chua, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Chua again. Thank you very much for his excellent uh, talk today. And uh, thank you also to the organizer and all the uh, participants today. Uh, I think we will uh, wrap up the session here till we meet again. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you okay. very much. Bye-bye. Happy New Year, everyone.